Hi, welcome everyone to the stream. I am Architect Chin Megor, co-founder of Equim. Uh, if you guys can hear me, just drop a thumbs up in the chat box. Be very active in the chat box. This is a very informal, casual session that we do usually on Sundays when everyone is free and you know, when you are trying to explore what exactly parametric architecture is and how you can take your learnings forward and simultaneously learning some new concepts that you can apply in various different fields or different projects or at different workflows of different scale. So if you all can hear me properly, uh, just drop a yes in the chat box. If I am audible, if you can hear me, just drop a yes in the chat box. Let's see. Okay, so gradually the the uh, viewer count would go up. Some of you are already here. You're saying yes. Okay, all right. I take it that the feed is fine. You can hear me properly. You can see my screen. You can see me. Well, that's good. Now, today's session is is the part four of a series that we are doing of free webinars. It's uh, we in the part one uh, we did. We did introduction to parametric architecture, introduction to Rhino and Grasshopper. In second part, uh, we started exploring some parametric tower designs. In the third part, we did something called attractor point. And don't worry if you have not watched that, those uh, previous streams or previous videos, because I'll try to cover most of them in the exercise that we are going to do today and build on the same complexity and simultaneously, you know, control certain parameters of a skyscraper using certain attractor points and I will define what attractor point is before we dive into the session before we you know start up with all the technical stuff and softwares and tools and everything I would like to understand how the audience is today so if you are an absolute beginner type in beginner in the chat box if you have some experience with Rhino Grasshopper type intermediate or if you've been using them uh, these tools for quite some time now type expert although no one is an expert in this field but still uh, let's try to understand how the consensus is today so type beginner intermediate or expert in the chat box and this will also allow some of the people who are uh, some of the people who are trying to join in to join in and you know this will be up on YouTube. This is already up on YouTube and the video will stay there. So if you miss out on certain thing, it's all right. You can always come back and rewatch it. I would highly recommend that you sh should watch the previous three videos that are there. Those are very highly informational uh, sort of streams that we did in the past few weeks. So I see most of you are beginner here. That's all right. So I'll try to tone it down to suit all of your needs I mean to suit to make sure that all of you who are at the beginner stage can make the most out of it uh, how many of you have attended some of the previous webinars that we have conducted through Equim so if it's your first time here type first if it's your second time third time type second or third okay so Darshan has attended dams well that's great you got pretty great in you must have gotten pretty great insights of how the parametric field is taken up in the in, entire global scenario Salman is here for the third time welcome back Salman and I hope that the things that you're learning you're gradually putting them to use uh, Darshan is here for the fourth time Sahil Pratik Shitij are here for the first time great okay let me see fourth time second time Great. Okay. Beginner, fourth time, first, first. All right. So those of you who are here for the first time, let me just introduce everything to everything to you. Let me just open up this presentation, and I will not go through through this presentation. It's a very elaborate. You know, it takes up like one um, solid one hour, and we have covered this very you know in, you know in very excruciating details in the previous videos or previous streams that we have done. And again, Equim is an architectural and research organization that intends to uh, 
talk and propagate these tools of the future, these tools of the present, or rather I should say that are not very widely accepted or used in India so far. But if you talk of a global scenario, the designing methodology has, has changed with the introduction of technology and especially in the past one year where everyone has been learning new skill set, where everyone has been exploring how they can evolve as a designer not just as a manual designer rather as a computational designer as well because we are living in 21st century and it's quite evident that you cannot you know excel in any field if you disregard technology technology has become like an evident part of our lives right and with uh, with mobile phones with computers with everything that is that is uh, that we surround ourselves with uh, we are we have entered the stage of uh, um, i should put it in a way we have entered the stage where everything is technologically driven and why should architects lag behind we should take as much advantage as any other field is taking out of it so i won't be going through this presentation let me just briefly introduce to you what parametric architecture is and you can always go back to some of the pre previous webinars let me just scale the camera viewport okay and yep yeah. all right so let me Let's talk about what parametric architecture is very briefly and then let's step into the practical part. If you are looking forward to understanding what exactly parametric architecture is, what is how you can define parametric architecture theoretically, I would highly recommend that you go back to some of the previous webinars and watch those videos after you attend today's session. So if I have to put it in a nutshell, what of what parametric architecture is you see there is a lot of data scientists that have pop up, popped up in the past few years and everything is driven through technology everything is being driven through data so corporations like google facebook microsoft why do they collect so much data why um, have have you ever uh, tried to question that why do they want to understand your interests your likings your dislikings your surroundings why so that they can predict you so that they can pr produce some tools and i don't want to be pessimistic i don't want to focus on the con uh, cons of collecting data right now i'm I, i'm trying to be optimistic here and you know uh, i would like to bring your attention to how this data this ai this machine learning is helping everyone to evolve their products further to evolve the understanding that they have of the masses further and the same can be implemented to architecture so if i have to briefly concise it into into like uh, five minutes in defining what parametric architecture is before i step into that i would request all of you to drop in your names and email ids in the chat box we will be sharing some resources over email those of you who are here with us some session files some scripts that we work on today so that in your free time when you when you have installed all the tools when you are good to go when you are in a, at a good pace you can circle back and you know start exploring them so start uh, dropping your name and email ids in the chat box and i will give you brief 30 seconds to do that Meanwhile, let me just have a look at the chat box as well. Okay, some of you have attended DAM, that's good. Most of you here are for the first time. Some of you have attended some of the previous sessions. Well, okay. So drop in your name and email IDs in the chat box. We will be sharing some of uh, the resources with you after the session. All right, so let's talk about data, let's talk about architectural data, and let's talk about parametric architecture. All right, okay. Great, so when we talk about any architectural exercise or any architectural competition or any project, let me just write it down. I'm summing it up as an architecture architectural challenge or a problem so when you have to design something uh, 
at a site be it hypothetical or be it live it's a design challenge or a design problem for which your design is a solution right okay so what do you do as soon as you in get introduced to certain uh, design challenge or problem what do you do you start collecting data data like where is the site what is the site about what is the groundwater availability what are the visibility angles from the road what is this uh, where is the north so that you can determine the sun path what are the prevailing winds how's the rainfall over the year the when you talk about wind uh, what is the velocity of the wind what if if it does it fall in the uh, uh, what should i say uh, does it fall in the cyclonic zones or the uh, uh, the winds that are there the prevailing winds that are there are of moderate to low uh, velocity all these things are certain things that you collect uh, you know and what is the seismic activity and the list goes on and on i mean all of you are trained um, in architecture and um, you must be in architectural college or must be practicing out there so you already know what all these things are what all, what what is the data that you collect and let me tell you and you must have understood that there is two type of type of data one is scientific in nature or if i have to write i can say tangible in nature things like sun and wind movement things like seismic activity things like ground water availability humidity precipitation all these are very scientific in nature they have certain uh, units associated with them and we as architects we are trained to more or less understand that data but we are not geologists we are not physicists we cannot understand that data exactly we didn't cannot understand that data very scientifically if i have to put it some of you can some of you who are very keen on learning it learning all those things can do that but most of us aren't most of us uh, have a general understanding of the data and based on that we evolve our designs right so one is scientific data the other one is uh, intangible data now what is intangible data the narrative behind the design okay narrative behind the design or the art behind the design psychology uh, client's requirements client's story your story that you are trying to put forward through the structure that you are designing because obviously architecture is combination of art and science right so in the the art part is intangible data and the science part is the tangible data all right what do we usually do we take all of this data we put it inside our head both intangible and tangible we put it inside our head and we start evolving design our designs this is the traditional workflow that we all of us follow right correct guys do you agree with me type yes if you agree with me yeah do you agree that this is how we usually design that is how we are taught to design in the colleges or in the in the fields that we are practicing yes yeah so th this is where fault arises i mean i'm not saying it's not it's wrong but you cannot be precise if you take all the scientific data put it inside your head and just based on your experience and in your intuition uh, you start solving that scientific data right now what is parametric architecture let's move to the next slide what is parametric architecture parametric architecture is simply taking all those scientific data that we come across like wind sunlight weather conditions and many more and combining them and computing them objectively now what is objective evaluation there is no subjectiveness there is no emotion there is no differentiation if 2 plus 2 is 4 for me 2 plus 2 will be 4 for you if we are objectively looking at it right if we are subjectively looking at it then 2 plus 2 could be 5 or 10 and don't start trolling me i'm not saying 2 plus 2 is 10 or 5 i'm saying if you look at it subjectively then it changes with person to person but the thing is the sunlight and wind these are all objective things these are scientific things so taking all of those things and computing it objectively and coming up with the most optimized result is what parametric architecture is in a nutshell and again i'm 
I'm uh, I won't I'm not doing justice at defining parametric architecture in such a short or in a brief version of this presentation so you should definitely check out the previous video but try to understand what I'm trying to explain here yeah so coming up with the most optimized result by ob objectively evaluating all these parameters and controlling these parameters is parametric architecture now some of you might think that okay let me go back to the first slide some of you might think that if a building is very curvy it is parametric architecture or if it is very twisted it looks very complicated it is very parametric architecture no it is these curvy and these complex looking buildings are just an outcome or a byproduct of parametric architecture. Your building could be perfectly, uh, it could be a cuboid, a perfect cuboid and still be derived computationally. Okay, so form or the outer appearance or the material that you are using or the cost or the technology that you are using while constructing is it constructing the building is not something that defines parametric architecture okay so it is it is a complete myth that complex buildings are parametric architecture or parametric architecture if you are designing something and if you are constructing something parametrically it will shoot up the cost of construction it is a myth you can practically use the same material same technology and still derive the form or derive the building or the design computationally and it is bound to perform better when it is put in the real world and again i'm doing i'm not doing a great job at explaining parametric architecture in such a concise terms okay so bear with me here all right so this is what traditional workflow looks like where you have a challenge you you collect all the tangible data and intangible data right and you take it all inside your head and based on your intuition experience and subjectiveness you come up with a solution now the problem with the solution is it is neither tested it is nor optimized so you do not know whether your building will perform very nicely or very poorly until you build it correct right this changes with parametric workflow you get the challenge you have you collect the data you collect intangible data and you collect tangible data you feed the tangible data to the computer you take care you personally take care of the intangible data and based on the fusion of the both a result is produced if you are happy with the result you can move forward with it if you are not happy with the result you can always come back change the inputs that you have given or change the outputs that the computer is giving you and then come up with a new solution and this particular solution is optimized it is tested and there is absolutely no loss of data if your building perform is 70 percent efficient you will know that right at the conceptual stage right at the conceptual stage right right where you're designing the form right where you're designing the ideology you will know how your building is going to perform if you move forward with it if you are happy with 70 percent you can move forward with it or you can change you can come up with a new design and you know you you can reach 80 percent 90 percent whatever suits you suits your requirements suits your needs so the biggest thing that comes out of parametric workflow is informed decisions informed decisions yes this is life yes okay now my my question to all of you is when an architect designs a building and it is constructed it stays there for next 50 100 years to come right so do you think the age we are living in with global warming rising up every day with environment degrading every day can we afford to design poor buildings that do not perform that are just a burden on the environment can we do that anymore no right we can't do that anymore so the decisions that we have to make the designs that that we are making we need to make sure that they perform very nicely that when they are built in the environment are not guesswork rather a solid proof of concept that you have made and you can only be sure about those designs you can only make those uh, you know informed choices once you test your buildings once you evolve it parametrically 
so that is why it there is a crucial need of parametric you know fusing parametric workflow into our solu in, into our workflow right now today do you guys agree with me type yes if you agree with me that we need to do something in order to make sure that we are not just doing guesswork so if you agree with me type yes in the chat box and it is okay to disagree as well if you disagree type your reason as well so that i can you know count um, provide you with the counter of it all right i see i see that you guys agree with me some of you so far right so this is how we need to evolve our architectural practice this is how we need to our evolve our architectural workflow and it will not happen in a day it is a gradual process you keep on learning you keep on evolving that is how it works okay now i'm just going to skip through a couple of slides let's uh come to why does architecture need computational design let me just briefly talk about the benefit of using computational design before i step into the practical part which will be the major part for today's session so we will be exploring something very cool today and it won't be performance based but it would be something uh, very nice and you know you would uh, come across those concepts and you'll you'll realize how what sort of flexibility parametric architecture can offer you all right multiple design iterations now let's say you have a site and for a particular site you have bylaws right you have bylaws and then you have client's requirements your own personal requirements as that you want to put into the design as an architect as a designer so what can you do you can define all those parameters that will be uh, you know controlling the design outcome and design an algorithm behind that and then let the computer design multiple iterations for an example as you can see here on uh, on this image on the right uh what this showcases here is have a look this is a site and the computer was asked to design floor plates in the first iteration it utilized the entire plot area the entire site area and probably produced like four or five floor plates then in the next iteration it made eight floor plates and you know made a central courtyard then instead in the next iteration instead of making one big central courtyard it it made some different openings some smaller openings in the next one it started stacking them so you can see how this is evolving further in the next set of it generation instead of using the entire site area it started using some part of the area for example in this one um yes aditya in uh, i mean not in this particular example it is not you calculating the far but you can you know the design algorithm that you know controls that is controlled by the far that is defined in that particular site so in this in this one here it used half of the site area in this one it used one fourth of the area and then here it made a hybrid for the first two floors it used the entire area and for the remaining it kind of used one fourth and this is a hybrid where it splitted it is kind of using one half of the site but instead of using it in just one uh, one what should i say quadrant it is using two different quadrant quadrants and then uh, a simple hybrid of this and this can be seen here right the mic is making very much noise okay let me see if i can if i can fix this all right um all right i hope my uh, voice quality is better now uh sir so i'm uh, i'm an architect do i need to learn to code gradually yes if you are looking to be an architect who is relevant in the next 15 years who who does not become obsolete yes you should learn to code but not immediately it's a gradual process you need to learn certain things first and then move to code okay let me come back to the topic here and in this one you can see there is a hybrid where there, there there are two towers and then there is stacking wherein l shapes are being made then there are some corridors getting made so this is how uh 
this is how computer you can pretty much see that based on the complexity of your design it can generate thousand different design ideas for you and the thing is you do not have to choose the design that it has made directly you can evolve it further on your own you can evolve it further manually this is just giving you ideas so architecture becomes more of a visual exercise rather than every you think of everything in your head and then start sketching and then start taking it to various different tools that you might be using it becomes uh, it becomes more of a visual exercise then there is something called repetitive task automation wherein you can see that the, let's consider that this is a building that you see here down here and these are different openings let's say these are windows in the building okay and how many of you know what a door window schedule is and i have given this example probably 100 times now so uh, how many of you know what a door window schedule is type yes if you know what a door window schedule is type no if you don't i'll explain it here and let's keep the chat box very active for today yes okay so door window schedule is basically when you design a building uh, whatever openings there are whatever door or windows there are you have to pr produce very technical or fabrication drawings out of it so for example if this is a window here so you have to make a drawing that showcases that okay this is a hexagon and the radius of this hexagon is this what is the trim size because obviously there would be a trim here what is the trim size what is the material of this what is the specification all those things very technical that you can send out to the fabricator and he can produce these windows and doors and you can bring it to the site and install it on the building so what happens usually this is made on autocad or or tools like these manually but with with computation design you can automate these things now imagine this building has 3000 different size windows Uh, I'll come back. I'll circle back to your question, Karan. Uh, imagine that this building here has three thousand different size doors and windows, and if you had to make all of these manually, it would probably take you a month to make it, or fifteen days, right? And if there is a change from client's end where this entire design changes, and there is a different set of three thousand windows, what would you do? Quit your job? <laughs> well with computation design or parametric architecture you can automate this task you can tell the computer that extract each one of these windows start drafting it start drafting it write all these dimensions that you need start labeling it a b or whatever and export cat drawings out of it that you can directly plot and send out to fabricator so you can repeat you know uh, assign the computer to do the labor work for you right Yes, it can be done on ArchiCAD as well. So Karan asks which software is used for previous slide, as in where we put the data and the block models are generated. You can pretty much do this in Rhino and Grasshopper straight, Karan. Okay. After repetitive task automation comes testing the design, which is one of the most crucial part. So let's say if you design a building, and I'll just take a cuboid for an example. let's say this is a building you can simulate sun and see how your building performs against the sun what is the solar gain that's happening inside the building how much sunlight each floor plate is receiving you can simulate winds here and see what sort of wind pressure this building would receive what would be the ventilation inside the building you can simulate loads on it and understand where exactly your building would start fail is start to fail then you can simulate earthquakes you can simulate pretty much all the factors or all the data that we collect here you can simulate and test it around all those data or the factors so testing the design is one of the biggest things that comes out of parametric architecture or computation design which is like one of the most vital thing as well okay all right now i won't continue i mean 
there's a couple of more slides here but i won't be diving deeper into it you can always look back at the previous webinars those of you who are uh, attending it for the second and third or fourth time you already know what this is uh, so let me introduce where exactly parametric architecture came into play and this is a very iconic building by zaha hadid in azerbaijan baku so uh, first stage of parametric architecture was folding folding in architecture that came into existence after introduction of software like maya in 1995 so you can pretty much see that uh, it's uh, as soon as i say folding you can pretty much evidently see that in the design here where one single element or one single surface is modulated and it become it becomes the wall here it becomes facade here it becomes the ceiling at this point and at this point and then it again becomes a wall here and then it becomes a floor plate here right and in this example this surface is ceiling and then it becomes a part of the landscape so this was good this gave a new expression in architecture architects were able to express the design ideas in a more vivid term but there uh, there was a there was a con behind this particular designing methodology the cost went up very high cost went up very high why because each of these panels that you are seeing had to be custom produced had to be custom produced now as you can imagine if you go out and buy a furniture that is produced in mass it costs you less but if you design something that is custom that is unique to you and you start manufacturing it it costs you more anything that is custom produced will cost you more so the cost automatically went up high the carbon footprint was very high and you know uh, okay the carbon footprint was very high and the cost was very high there was a lot of wastage as well because you can see that there is a lot of custom production so a lot of material would be wasted a lot of a lot of uh, engineering would be done on 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 all each of these panels so this change with introduction of grasshopper now grasshopper is a visual scripting tool in which there are components like these that we will be exploring today in the practical part of the session so what uh, what we accomplished through it was uh, there is a canvas in which you can design an algorithm algorithm now what is algorithm if i say that this is x and this is y take x from let's say uh, someone in the chat box let's say x is 2 and y is 3 and i define an algorithm that x plus y will be my outcome so what would be would be my outcome 5 right now if i change this x to 3 this 5 would change to 6 automatically so this is what an algorithm is in 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 a very simpler term so that is that is what is being designed here that you can see on the canvas and don't panic it's a very easy tool it's a very algorithm developing these algorithms do not require any coding knowledge that was the best part of grasshopper that you do not need to learn any coding to start off with grasshopper to design these algorithms you can simply take some of the components that are placed up on top you know drag and drop them on the canvas and connect them with each other using these wires and it will automatically code the entire algorithm for you yes you can integrate c++ java python c sharp and all those coding languages inside grasshopper as well but that comes at an intermediate stage when you just start off you can pretty much produce very fantastic cool looking designs very uh, and you the designs that perform very nicely in the world right out of the box from grasshopper so with grasshopper this changed and with that came the latest stage of parametric architecture that is known as tectonism and what changed with tectonism is that you usually how it goes is when you get a design challenge you have a concept you move from concept to making 
architectural drawing architectural drawing out of the once once the architectural drawing is made then you move towards fabrication drawings fabrication drawings or some of us call it working drawings okay then we produce working drawings and then construction takes place so what happens is you design a building you make architectural drawings out of it when you reach this fabrication drawing stage that is when you start exploring the market okay this size of the panel is available this these are the products that are available in the market and how we can use them in our design uh, so that we do not have to custom produce everything we can you make use of what is already there in the market in our design that is what you do in fabrication or working drawings right but this changes with tectonism what happens is right at the conceptual stage you bring in engineering logics engineering when i say engineering logics how the material would get joined with each other uh, if if there is one beam there is another column how would it get joined and you do not need to get into the technicality just try to understand what i'm trying to say here so you bring in the engineering logics right at that stage and then combination of both of these produces the design now when you produce architectural drawings out of it these drawings are automatically optimized to the market standards these are automatically optimized to the market standards so you do not have to custom produce anything uh, you can directly use whatever you define in engineering logics right at this stage so this gives you a chance this saves a lot of time this saves a lot of trouble of you know um, reaching this sometimes what happens is when you reach this fabrication stage that is when you realize that your design is not uh, possible to construct using the tools or the using the uh, products that are already in the market so you have to circle back to the architectural drawing change your design a little bit tweak your design further to accommodate what is out available out there with this workflow that changes it becomes a linear work process okay i'll end this presentation here let me have a look at uh what are some of the questions here what software are suitable for computation design for architects the best tool that is available out there is rhino and grasshopper to if you are just starting out in your career towards computation design and parametric architecture later on you can start bringing incorporating maya with rhino and grasshopper and all those things you can you can explore for their plugins that are available for their coding languages and grasshopper can very easily be integrated with uh, revit or archicad so whatever designs that you are making in rhino and grasshopper can easily be trans you know uh, taken to revit for production of uh, construction drawings okay let me open up rhino let me just show you what what we would be learning today so that would give you a sense of understanding of what today's session is going to be like so this animation that you see here so consider that this yellow ball is sun although sun does not move like this just consider it for for an example right now that this the uh, this is the light source and based on uh, uh, this animation you can pretty much see as uh, you can pretty much see that as the ball is moving the panels are changing their sizes their shapes how much they are getting extruded from the tower how, how wide is the opening everything is getting changed so we'll be making something like this today okay all right let me just go ahead and quickly minimize it and let me bring rhino just to showcase you what we would be learning today so we would be learning something like this as you can see if i move the slider and you can see that the ball is changing its position and the uh, design the entire design is automatically updating as well in some of the previous webinars that we have done in the first webinar what we did was we uh, you know this was just an introduction of what a point is 
what how you can make curves out of it and what is numbers what is series what is range and then how you can make some surfaces and you know divide that surface and produce something out of it so, so all those things were something that we covered in the first webinar in the second webinar what we did was uh, we made a okay this one is third part two all right let me just set one curve so in the uh, second webinar we developed something like this here let me turn on the previews here import a curve so you can pretty much see that how this this entire tower is getting made and let's see where exactly this is yeah something like this and this changes shapes as as we move these graphs so these are some things that we explored in the second iteration of the webinar that we did and this all everything that we are seeing here will be covered today again in the session that we are conducting right now in the third webinar what we did is there is something called attractor point so if i turn this on and let me just walk in here let's make a couple of points and I will explain how Rhino works how everything works so don't worry about it will take some time to compute all right in the second webinar we did something like this which is known as attractor point so basically I defined a point and based on the location of this point the design outcome is controlled so you can see as I move this point in Rhino the design automatically updates and this could be a ceiling or this could be a, a, a partition wall or a, or a storage unit or a landscaping element I mean I'm not talking about what this design is rather I'm talking about concepts here so you can see that there are some points that that I defined in in Rhino and based on the position of these points this design outcome is controlled so this is what we did in part three of the webinar and today what we are going to do is a fusion between part three and part four wherein we make a parametric tower that looks something like this let me show you so we make some floor slabs floor plates let me go ahead and delete this uh, yeah we make some floor plates and based on those floor plates we try to change the area of the floor plates and then you we rotate them and then we make a tower that looks something like this and this entire tower let me bring in our data dam here and don't worry about the script don't worry about anything i know it might be looking uh, very confusing of confusing what exactly is happening I'll start from the very basics I'm just trying to explain what all things we would be covering today okay so this is loft and you can see that if I change this graph the entire shape of the tower or how this tower is you know designed gets changed or I can also control how big or how small each of the floor is so we'll be designing something like this and after we do that we will be we will be making some facade over it we will be making some designs over it so you can see that i scaled some of the windows and these windows will be controlled based on a particular point that is this particular point here so you can see that let me turn this on this okay you can see that can you can you guys see that there is a there is a ball down here right and there is this tower here and as as this ball changes its position the entire facade automatically updates right as this sphere is changing its position the entire facade is automatically updating so this is basically a combination between a tractor point and the tower exercise that we did and don't worry I'll start off from the very beginner stage itself okay so the end product would be something like this where where we make something like this and if I turn this off if I go to the top view top view Okay. Yeah. And if I turn on wireframe, let's turn. Okay. This is how 
the the design in the end looks let's try to explore let's let me just go ahead let me put this on the side and let me open up a fresh rhino screen so meanwhile if you have any questions feel free to shoot them in the chat box i'll try to address as many questions as i can okay once you launch rhino this is how it looks all right this is how it looks and it looks complicated at first it's true that it looks complicated at first but don't worry what happens is rhino puts everything at three different places so you can find the curve tools everything that is related to curve in this tab here the curve tools you can also find the same things in here on the top toolbar that says curve you can find the same tools here and you can find the same tools here as well on the left so rhino tries to put everything at three different positions so when you're working with it you can try pretty much try exploring everything uh, from you know whatever comes first to you what whatever is closer to your mouse you can pretty much use uh, that particular tool from whatever toolbar you want to so there there looks like a lot of two components but there are not so don't panic don't worry about it all right i'll just do some of the basics i'll just uh, cover a couple of basics about what uh, how computer understands 3d and i would like to know i'm sorry i'm really curious when will be the results of dam contest be out uh, i believe they will be out tomorrow uh, selfmade.in all right okay how many of you uh, okay how many of you are beginner and how many of you are professionals uh, if you are from architectural field type architecture student or type architecture professional or or if you are from some other field you can type in the name of your field as well let me understand the consensus here today um msi is good laptop for architectural use yep um msi is uh, i mean it depends it does company doesn't matter it depends on the configuration so if if uh, usually if you are buying higher end laptops from msi that are somewhere around 1l um they they are usually good laptops for architectural use they can support rendering they can support a lot of computation all right most of you are architectural students i see architecture technologist i okay that could be something interesting architecture student and kind of a professional at the same time well that's night you might be practicing or you know um taking up some freelance project so that's good i'm a graduate great be civil beginner nice all right great great so let me just brief you very quickly most of you might already be knowing what this is so when we talk about 3d there are basically three different coordinates and this everything that i'm explaining here is explained in very excruciating details in the part 1 of the webinar so you should check that out so this is x this is y and this is z all right when we this is the coordinate system so whenever you design something in 3d it has certain coordinates associated to it so if i make a point here so this point would be defined by x y and z coordinates so for example if i say 5 8 and 0 so this means that this point is in 5 units in the x scale in the x co coordinate or on the x axis 8 units in the y and it, uh, it is sitting right on the x y plane because it is 0 in the z all right okay let's come back to rhino and grasshopper so in rhino if you have to orbit right click if you are coming from sketchup usually sketchup uh sketchup is you know controlled by middle click you can orbit around by you know middle clicking and dragging your mouse 
that changes in case of rhino you right click and move your mouse to orbit if you have to pan you right click and press shift at the same time to pan around here and there all right on the left are some of the tools and rhino is very similar to cad as well so if i type in point and hit enter or space bar the command would be executed and you can see that there is a point right near my cursor right near to my cursor and wherever i'll click it will make a point okay so there is a point here so i can draw multiple points and if i have to make some lines i can use this polyline command or i can type in polyline as well so if i click this i can make some lines here i can make some curves yes and then i can make some basic shapes like these and right now it's it is in wireframe so you can click on this uh, uh, bottom down arrow and choose what type of preview style do you want to observe the geometry in so i can choose rendered or shaded or whatever i want to i'll choose shaded for now so this is a cuboid and these are some basic this this is just to get you started in rhino you can develop i mean some very organic geometries very quickly for example i'm just making a surface here you can select a surface and type in rebuild and this this option pops up here i'll change this to 8 and 8 and i'll hit okay and i'll press f10 so there are these points and you you know you can start sculpting this surface so if i move these points up you can pretty much see that i can very organically model certain things i can very organically model or be, it becomes a very visual exercise yes so i can make some very organic shapes out of it or i can what i can do is if if let's say if this is a curve this is a curve and i'll just make a copy of this curve by let me just do it again if you're not if you when you select and if you do not see this gumball sort of thing you can this gizmo sort of thing when you select anything you can turn it on from down here that says gumball if i turn it off it will go away if i click back on it will turn on gumball and you can see there are some snap settings here just like autocad just like cad software there are some snaps so you can press and hold alt and you can draw drag in any of the axis to make a copy so there is this copy of this curve let me change the shape a bit so let's change the shape here okay and then i'll make one more copy okay so there are these three three curves and there's a command called loft so how does how does any 3d software understand a surface what is a surface so basically just like a cotton fabric how does a cotton fabric look something like this it has threads going in the horizontal direction and then it has threads running in the vertical direction right it has threads running in the vertical direction so these are stitched together that is what makes this fabric these similarly this is how uh, uh, rhino interprets the surface these horizontal lines are called u and these vertical lines are called v okay so if i come back here i want to make a surface between these three curves that i have just made so there is a very simple command called loft i'll type loft and hit enter and i can select this this and this and hit enter and i'll just do okay and you can pretty much see that it made a very organic sort of shape right out of uh, the three curves that i had and i can add as many curves as i want so you can also make you can directly make surfaces or you can make um, surfaces from curves you can design these curves on uh, cad and import them here this is pretty basic stuff and this was just introduction the main exercise begins now okay i'll just come back to the center of the viewport there is a question hello sir so i completed my br this year and i'm at a stage where i'm exploring various things and i see parametric architecture very interesting and i want to walk on this path now should i go ahead like theoretical knowledge software profession okay um 
current the first thing that you need to do is to first of all understand what parametric architecture is and start exploring it whatever you learn start producing designs out of it the best way to learn something is whatever project you are working on whatever exercise you are working on design it computationally whatever tools you have learned be it any you know be it at any level that you are at try to design it on that level then when you are uh, you are bound to stuck at certain different points that is when you'll start exploring new things you will start testing that is when you'll start experimenting and looking for new solutions that's how your knowledge would increase and yes theoretical knowledge is very important i'll talk about all of this towards the end of this session karan okay so to la launch grasshopper you can either type grasshopper and hit enter or you can click this green bug icon on the top okay so i'll just click this green bug icon on the top and that should launch grasshopper okay so when grasshopper is launched this is how it looks i'll go to file and i'll hit new okay this is how it looks and i just explain in the uh, ppt that this is the canvas this is where you design your algorithm and the uh, everything that you design in grasshopper it stays in grasshopper the but the output preview is shown in rhino so a good way to work around it is you place grasshopper on one half of your screen and rhino on another half of your screen okay all right let's begin so what i want to do today is i want to make a rectangle first of all and once i have made this rectangle i want to copy it this rectangle on the z axis this vertical axis the line that i have just made is z axis right um i want to copy this floor plate multiple times on this axis and then scale each of these floor plates with a with a parameter and then even rotate them in certain angles and then make a surface out of it okay let's not over complicate things let's start off with very basic so what i'll do is in rhino i will type rectangle if you think that something uh, something i did is too fast let me know in the chat box by the way everything that i'm doing for the first 15 minutes here from now is something that is already covered in the last session okay all right so this is this is the, a rectangle that i made in rhino right now this rectangle is in rhino and i want to bring this rectangle inside grasshopper so that i can perform certain things on it all right let's do that let's start off by doing that only i'll keep this here all right so you can double click and type a name of the component or you can bring it from here or you can you know drag and drop some components from up on top here all right and these are called components these are components orange color of a component means that that particular component is empty right now it does not have anything inside it or if it is if it has something inside it it needs something more okay so this is right now orange and there is a, a sort of a balloon on the top right here if you click on it you'll see that it says floating parameter fail to collect data because i did not define anything now this this rectangle that i made in rhino this is a curve right so i'll just double click and type in curve here and i can right click you can pretty much see that this is orange because it is empty right now i have not defined what curve this is so i can right click on it and i can click on set one curve and look at what happens as soon as i click on set one curve grasshopper vanishes from the screen so that means that as soon as you click set on set one curve grasshopper understands that you want to bring something from rhino inside grasshopper that's why grasshopper is hidden and rhino is showing uh, is shown in front of you so i'll select this curve and as soon as i'll select this curve grasshopper comes back white color means 
that the component is running fine okay there is something called but you cannot see the rectangle here you cannot see the rectangle inside grasshopper if you have to see the rectangle you can see that as i'm selecting it the component turns green at the same time this rectangle here in rhino also turns green right are you guys following is my pace good type yes if you all are following if you are all here with me this is like just the beginning great all right so this is the curve and if you have to check what is inside a particular component because you cannot see right now it is just an icon that you are able to see on the screen right if you have to check and see what this this curve means uh, or what this component has inside it you can double click and type in panel or you can also bring it up from top here okay so you can drag the output of any component and connect it to the input of another component you can never connect an output to an output okay let me just explain this this here is this is input okay and this is output and in the center is where processing happens this is where processing happens all right so you have to connect the output of one component to the input of another component and how do you connect it by clicking and dragging from the output a wire from the output to another input and as soon as i do that you can see that this panel here says that this component has one referenced curve polyline curve inside it you can see that this is a polyline curve that this curve this component has inside it i'll just delete this panel here okay now what i want to do is i want to make a copy of this curve in the z axis so i can double click and type there just like how there is a command called linear array polar array in cad there is a com similar commands are here i mean most of the commands that you use in cad are already in inside rhino and grasshopper so you can you know if you double click and type in scale there is a scale if you double click and type in rotate there would be rotate if i type in linear array there would be this linear array and and if i hover over it can you see what it says it gives you a hint of what this component will do so it says that it will create a linear array of geometry whatever geometry you will give it it will make copies of it linearly so i can type in linear array and now this linear array has three comp three inputs first one is what is the geometry that you want to copy i want to copy this curve so i'll just connect this curve output to the geometry input of linear array okay then it is asking us for the direction which direction do you want to copy it in so i can double click and type in z so unit z okay so i want to copy it in the z direction i'll connect it in the direction here now factor is what should be the distance between two two different rectangles right now you can see that there are they are very close to each other so i can double click and type let's say 25 or 30 or something so you can see that as soon as i connect it the if i put it in architectural terms the floor to floor height increases yes can you see that as i'm moving this slider okay to bring this slider you can double click and type in any number so if i type in 25 it will give me a slider at 25 and you can click and drag on this slider to change the value so you can see as i'm increasing or decreasing it uh, it is increasing or decreasing the floor to floor height okay so i can you know right click on it and i can just rename it floor to floor height because that is what this uh, slider is controlling all right then the next one is count how many copies do you want and if you hover over it it will say number of elements in in array and by default there is a value of 10 set you can double click and give it any number let's say 25 here again so i can connect this here 
and it will give me 25 floor plates can you see that it, it gave me 25 floor plates and i can increase or decrease the number of floors by moving this slider so in architectural terms what is this slider co controlling number of floors right number of floors okay good i have two things set up but now you can pretty much see that we have done this step where we made one rectangle and copied it in z axis multiple times and we can control how far they are each other, from each other and how what what is the number of these so this is this is how you define this this particular algorithm now this is a very small algorithm where you just made floor plates all right now what i want to do is i want to scale each of these rectangles with a different number so let's say i want to change the size of each of these rectangles so i can double click and type in scale so as soon as i double click and type in scale and hit enter this component comes up and this is asking us for three things first thing is what do you want to scale which geometry do you want to scale so i want to scale these geometries that are coming out of linear array right the next thing it is asking me is what is the center point where is the center point so whenever you scale something even in autocad it asks you around which point should i scale right around what point should i scale then the next thing is factor how big or how small do you want to make it so what i will do is for center i will calculate the center of each of these rectangles i'll calculate the center of each of these rectangles so there is a very straightforward method of doing that there is a command called area and if i connect this geometry in area here you can see that uh, it gives me the area of each of the rectangle which will obviously be the same because it is the copy these rectangles are copy of the base rectangle that we made in rhino so the area of each one of them is same but at the same time it is also giving us center points of each of these rectangles and you can see that x and y value of each of the rect each of the point is same 44 and 37 44 and 37 44 and 37 but the z value is changing because it is being copied in height right so what i can do is i can give this centroid in center here okay and then i can connect this geometry in geometry okay once i do that i can control how big or how small i want if i want it it to reduce in size i'll give a number less than 1 i'll give a number that is less than 1 if i want to increase in in size i'll give a number greater than 1 so let's give it a number called let's say 0.2 so if i give it 0.2 you can see that the floor plates became very small can you guys see that the floor plates became very small and as i'm changing this number they they change their size correct yes okay quick shortcut quick tip here you should always try to organize your script very nicely so that the wires you can make sense of each of the wire that goes here and there very easily your script can get messed up or very messy so you should try to optimize how your script is looking visually although does that does not change how what your end product would be it is just for your understanding and you should always hide whatever you don't want to see so i don't want to see this original copy of the rectangle so i can middle click on it and i can release the middle click on this blind folded guy and this will hide you see that this grayed out and this will hide the uh, the that that particular components output from the rhino screen okay i did that now the thing is what's the point of having all the floor slabs of exactly the same size i could have just made a smaller rectangle in the first place so what i want to do is i want to scale each of these rectangle with a different number 
I want to scale each of these rectangles with a different number and I'll repeat myself again if you have not dropped in your name and email ID in the chat box please do that so that we can share some of the resources these this particular Rhino and Grasshopper file and all the files of the previous webinars as well with you after the session so drop in your name and email IDs in the chat box with which you have registered for this webinar and if you want to join the WhatsApp group that we have uh, that is entirely dedicated to discussion on parametric architecture where we share a lot of resources we keep you know we share keep on sharing some updates uh, you can I'm just dropping the link here in the chat box you can use that link and join the WhatsApp group and I'll pin this message okay all right so let's delete this 0 0.8 from the factor what I'll do is in the first webinar we covered something called concept of numbers that is what I'm going to use here which is called range so what I basically want is 21 different numbers between 0 to 1 I want 21 different numbers between 0 to 1 so that I can give them in the factor and each one of these rectangles could be scaled by those numbers. So what I'll do is, uh, and I also want to use a graph mapper. So I'll type in graph mapper here and I'll connect this range in graph mapper. How many numbers do I need? Steps is basically how many numbers do you need? So as many floors there are that many numbers I need right as many floors there are that many numbers we need so we can directly use this 21 in steps here but there is a problem with range that I explained in the first webinar is that it always gives us one extra so if you uh, if you tell it that if you give 20 here let me show you if I give 10 as an input in steps and if I bring a panel here so you can see that it is giving me <clears throat> countings always in the com in the computer counting always starts from zero so zero one two three four five six seven eight nine ten that means there are ten plus one eleven to numbers in total so it gave me eleven numbers between zero to one right so it always gives us one extra if i'll ask it for five numbers it will give me five plus one six numbers in total so what I can do is I can do a subtraction here. I can connect this 21 in A and I can subtract one from it. And let's connect this subtracted in result in steps. Now what will happen is it will always give me. Right now you can see that 20 plus one is 21 because counting is starting from zero. So it is giving me 21 numbers between zero to one okay and if I change this number of floors to 10 it will only give me 10 numbers so this is what a parametric workflow is wherein you automate everything you change one thing everything automatically updates you don't have to go and change everything over and over again all right so I have this range I can right click on this graph go to graph types and set any type of graph so I'll, I'll choose a sign graph and I can change the shape of the graph by moving this dot that that you can see here okay the tendency of this graph is to take numbers between 0 to 1 and give out numbers between 0 to 1 now I want you to know from you guys if I scale something by 0 what will happen if I scale something by 0 what will happen come on guys in the chat box and there is there are no wrong answers what do you think will happen if I scale something by zero? What will happen if I scale something by zero? Let's try to look, have a look at it. If I type in zero and give it inside the factor. Okay, some of you say it remains the same. What happens when you multiply a number by zero? If I multiply five by zero, what happens? The end result is zero, right? So if I connect this zero here, you can see that this component turned red. Red means that there is an error and the geometry vanished. Because if you multiply something by zero, the geometry will disappear. 
you are saying asking the gra asking grasshopper that hey take this geometry and reduce its size to zero so that means it will disappear what will happen if i change this number to 1 what will happen if i scale something by 1 what will happen if i scale something by 1 it will remain the the original size because if you multiply any number by 1 what will be the end result the same number right correct so if you multiply something by 1 it will remain the same so that means when you are scaling something the number should always be greater than 0 and less than 1 if you are scaling it down so what i can do is there is something called right now this graph mapper is giving us numbers between 0 to 1 you as you can see that you can see pretty much there is 0 and there is almost 1 here 0.98 is almost 1 so there is something called remap numbers so if i choose this remap numbers what this does is it changes the scale of the it preserves the proportion between the numbers it preserves the pro, uh, proportion between the numbers but changes the scale so if let's say there is there are two numbers 2 and 4 if there is 2 and there is 4 what is the proportion or let's say 2 and there is 2 and 6 what is the proportion between these numbers 3 right if i multiply 2 by 3 i'll get 6 if i'll remap it if i remap it it will become if i remap it between 20 if i make it 20 and 60 can you see the proportion is still the same but the numbers have changed or if i make it 0.2 and 0.3 the proportion is still the same but uh, sorry 0.6 here 0.6 the proportion is still the same of 3 but the numbers have changed so that is what i want to do i have numbers between 0 to 1 but i want to have them between i want to preserve the proportions between them but i want to have them between 0.4 and 0.9 so that my geometry makes sense if you if i'll have it at 0.1 the floor plate will become so small which is not possible architecturally okay so there there is something called remap numbers that is used to scale the numbers so i can uh, there is something called construct domain construct domain so it asks me for domain start and domain end so i'll put in domain start i'll put 0.4 and in domain end i'll put 0.9 and i can always change these numbers later on and i'll show you and i can connect this domain and target here this is my target this is where i want to change the numbers that are coming out of graph mapper okay then i'll just connect this graph mapper to value and what is source source is this remap numbers wants to know what is the minimum and maximum inside the, what is the minimum and maximum of the initial numbers so i'll just type in bounds there is a command called bounds through which you can calculate the minimum and maximum so you can check it out here the minimum is 0 and the maximum is 0.98 and if i change this you can pretty much see that this number also changes 0 to 0.60 so it just wants to know what is the minimum and maximum you can calculate the minimum and maximum by using bounds so i'll just connect this bounds to source here and if i connect this mapped value in factor you can see that each of the rectangle has been scaled by a different number okay now the best part is if i increase the number of floors you can pretty evidently see that and if i change the shape of this graph i can change the scale of each of the rectangle i can control the scale of each of the floor plates correct do you guys get it so far and you do not need to memorize this script you just need to understand the concept and you will get the script this video will be up here on youtube and you can start making it on your own i just want to understand do you guys understand the concept behind it or not type in yes if you understand the concept behind it so far and this is just the beginning guys this is just the beginning for today's session
let's let me see some yeses in the chat box okay great so we have scaled this now what i want to do is great now what i want to do is i want to rotate each of these rectangles wherever they are sitting so if i come back here if this is the top view or if this is the plan of the rectangle okay let me do a let me do justice to this rectangle oh, yeah okay so if this this is the rectangle i want to rotate this rectangle now if i ask you how can the rotation be done if this is a if this is the surface if all of you look at the camera let me just increase the size of the camera viewport here yeah let's say if if this is the rectangle either i can rotate it like this yes or i can rotate it like this or i can rotate it like this these are standard uh, rotational axes obviously you can rotate it like this as well but this rotation is on xy plane this rotation is on yz plane and this rotation is on xz plane correct so i can rotate it in, in three ways what i want to do here is i want to rotate them rotate all of these like this okay let me reduce the size all right let's start so these are scale geometries and if i just double click and type in rotate i can see that there is a component that will rotate whatever you will give it right so if i want to scale only a few floors and keep the dimension of the other floors constant how do i do it sir um you can uh, i mean you can manually define uh, some of the factors as one so that they remain the original size and uh, the remaining could be changed larry okay so this is the rotate component and again it is asking us for three inputs first is geometry what do you want to rotate i want to rotate these rectangles second is angle what should be the angle of rotation third is plane the thing that i just explained with the notebook that you can either rotate you can rotate in in pretty much infinitely in in the infinite planes but i want to rotate them today in the xy plane okay so what i can do is i can connect this geometry here and in angle i can right click right now by default this angle is set to radians i can right click on it and set to degrees i'll repeat myself once again if you have not dropped in your name and email ids in the chat box please do that we'll be sharing some resources with you after the session so make sure you have dropped in your names and email ids also there is a link pinned in the chat box uh through which you can join the whatsapp group where we keep on sharing some of the resources all right okay so you can right click on the angle and set it to degrees and as soon as you do that you can see a degree symbol right here and then it is asking us for plane so for plane i'll just use these centroids i'll just use these centroids in plane i'll connect the centroids in plane so that these centroids act as the center point and this will by default make the rotation in xy plane okay to keep my script sorted if i double click on a wire there is this relay that comes up through which i can organize my script this does not do anything this just makes your wire look a bit tidy okay now in angle either let me make a slider that starts at 0 and goes up to 360 if i connect it here let's hide all of these things i'll hide this scale geometry and have a look at what happens when i change this zero so when i change this can you see the entire tower the all the floor plates are getting rotated by this number by this by by the angle that i have defined that i'm defining through the number slider but this is not what i want to do i want to rotate each of these rectangles with a different with a different degree okay i want to rotate each of these rectangles with a different degree so what i'll do is 
instead of giving it one single input again i'll do the same thing that i did here in which i made a graph mapper and a range and i remapped them so i'll do the same thing here so what i can do is i can use the same range that is here i can use the same graph mapper the only thing that i need to change is this remap numbers so i'll just double click here and type in remap numbers or let me do it once again so i'll just type in graph mapper once again right click and i'll set the graph to sign again okay let's feed it some numbers this graph mapper needs some numbers how many numbers do we need as many floor plates there are and that particular thing is being done by this range we created some numbers using this range component right so what i can do is i can take the same range and i can connect it to this graph mapper as well let me just add a relay here so that the script is a bit sorted okay now once i have i have given some numbers to graph mapper and again you can see that this graph mapper will give me numbers between 0 2 1 but angles i need to give it angles between 0 to 360 or 180 or whatever it is that you want to give it so i can remap these numbers again so pretty much the same thing i'll just remap these numbers and instead of remapping them between 0.4 and 0.9 that i did here i'll just remap them between like i'll just type in construct domain and i'll remap uh, i'll define the starting point as 0 and i'll say that it can go as high as 360 okay so now the numbers that are coming out of graph mapper will be remapped between 0 to 360 all right i'll connect this graph mapper here and in source i'll connect bounds because graph uh, remap numbers wants to know the minimum and maximum that is coming out of this graph mapper and if i connect this mapped value in angle here have a look at what happens let me go to the top view this is how the top view looks now imagine making this floor plan on cad manually this will freak you out so you can see that each of the floor plate has been rotated by a different angle and i can control the rotation with this graph here Uh, you can see that as i'm moving this graph i can control the angle of rotation okay let's make a surface out of it let's give it some surface so i'll type in loft the thing that we did in rhino in, in where there were two three curves and we made a surface of, over it let's give it this loft and i'll hide this let's also hide this area that is showing us the center points and now you can see that if i ch i can come back here i can change the distance between the floor to floor i can change floor to floor height i can change how many floors there are i can change how what is the scaling of the floor i can also change how this rotation looks so instead of 360 i'll bring it back to something subtle like somewhere around 180 and i can change how complex or how simple this particular tower is yes this was a quick feed uh, quick recap of all the things that we have done so you can see that this becomes more of a visual exercise rather than you trying to design everything on your own you can set the premise and then uh based on that you can evolve your design further and the best part is if i just make a curve here let's make a curve instead of a rectangular floor plate if i come back here if i right click on this curve and do set one curve and select this curve here that i have just made you can see the same algorithm getting repeated all over to this particular curve giving us a new uh tower design entirely 
and instead of a tower this could also be an artifact or a trophy i mean the possibilities are endless that is that is how it depends on how creatively you are kind of applying it let's move it somewhere here yeah and if i just change the preview style okay so this is how it's looking yeah and you can pretty much see that i can control the scaling how complex or how simplified this is or and also the rotation as well so can i i can make it as organic as i want yeah is everyone following with me so far type yes if you were able to follow if you have understood the concept so far let's let's let me see let me have a look at the chat box let's see how you guys are doing yes sir again you can ask a question great gives you pretty much um, i mean gives you pretty much flexibility in while you are designing certain things out of it so i can again do set one curve i'm not following the beginning um so again you can you probably rewatch the webinar rewatch the video we just made a curve and then we copied in the z axis then we scaled it and then we rotated it and then we made a surface on it that's pretty much what we did let me just set the original curve that was this rectangle back here okay all right now we have this tower here what can we do over it now so what i want to do on it is this was making the design of the tower now what i want to do is i want to subdivide this entire tower so that it has faces over it it has some windows or some fa facade elements on it yes i want to do that so let's do that so i'll there is something called deconstruct brep if i if you'll check the output from loft it will say open brep brep is boundary representation that is how grasshopper defines this particular geometry so what i can say is there is something called deconstruct brep and i mean considering the things that we have to cover today i cannot get into the details of what a brep is what is deconstructing brep but try to follow along what what this deconstruct brep does is it basically explodes this one brep into four faces as you can imagine that uh this rectangular building must have four different faces then there are edges and then there are vertices okay i'll there is something called graft i'll right click here and i'll graft it what grafting does is it basically it basically uh separates each of the surface in different branches so imagine earlier if this is a tree all the faces were sitting right here in the trunk together if i remove this graft all these faces are sitting in one single branch right in the trunk of the tree when i graft this this tree gets four branches okay so one surface is sitting here another is here and another is here and another is here so it gets four branches inside it inside which it will have the surfaces so i'm just doing this to manage the data structure okay all right let me just delete this i've grafted this now what i can do is i will divide subdivide each of these faces into smaller panels to do that there is a command called isotrim and isotrim is something that we covered in very, in in detail in in the first webinar yeah in the first one and with isotrim we always use something called divide domain square so consider this i always give this example consider isotrim and divide domain square like uh like a tailor so once you go to the tailor and you ask him to ask the tailor to stitch something for you what does he do before cutting the sir, before cutting the fabric he takes a chalk and starts marking on the 
cloth cloth right so once he makes some markings on it and then he uses the scissor to cut the uh, cut the piece of cloth into pieces smaller pieces so divide domain square is the is like the chalk through which you make some markings on the surface and isotrim is like the scissor through which you split the surfaces into the markings that you have made so okay um you count as how many vert horizontal divisions you want and we count as how many vertical divisions you want so i'll say 20 okay 201 is too much let's connect 20 in u count and let's connect 3 or 4 in v count and if i connect these segments in domain let me hide this you can see that this entire surface has been split up into smaller quads these are called quads q u a d s quads yeah, now if i check the data you can see that instead of having just four surfaces it has very many surfaces and each of the branch has many surfaces right because each of the face has been splitted into smaller quads all right get it and you can see that there is zero 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 this is just the branch address and i can reduce these zeros by right clicking and clicking on simplify so as I simplify, this address has been simplified. This is more like uh, telling Grasshopper that this is Delhi, this is Mumbai, this is, I mean, just to separate the areas here and there. Okay. Once we do that, now we will try something called attractor point on it. Something called attractor point. We covered attractor point in detail in a different exercise uh, in the last webinar in the third part in which we made a grid and we basically divided this grid and using one point one attractor point we scaled all of these cells so each of the all the cells that were closer to this point were very small and everything that was far away was very big in size and based on the position of this point, uh, these these scaling was these these scales were getting affected. Okay, so how do we do that? How we can do that is let's say if this is our surface, and we have splitted this surface into six parts. All right, and this is our attractor point. So what we can do is we can calculate the distance between this attractor point and the center point of each of these quads, right? Each of these quads and based on this distance, based on this distance, we can control the scaling. So if the distance is greater, the scaling should be greater. If the distance is smaller, the scaling should be smaller. Okay, so let's come back here. Let's try to find the center points of each of these uh, quads that we see here. Let's try to find the center point of each of these quads. Now, if had it been a 2D geometry, we could have used area. If this was planar in nature where, you know, each of the quads was in one single plane, it was not twisted in nature. Uh, we could have just used area just like we used here area command to find the center of each of the rectangles but this is a 3d geometry it is in three different planes so we cannot use area for this we use something called evaluate surface evaluate surface and again evaluate surface is something that is very uh, that is covered in 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 part one of this webinar series okay um, what I can do is I can connect this surface here and I can right click and reparameterize this surface. Now what is reparameterize? Reparameterize. I'll try to briefly explain what reparameterize is. If I, and I want all of you to pay very close attention. This is a very crucial concept. Okay. So imagine if you have a rope. If you have a rope and you want to tie the length of this rope is 20 units 
length of this rope is 20 units and if you want to tie a knot right in the center how would you do it one way to do it is to measure 10 measure 10 units and tie a knot or another way would be to fold the rope in half and tie the knot wherever the center point comes right wherever the center point comes so in the second method you did not care about the length it could be 20 units or it could be 100 units folding it in half would always give you the center point right so you did not worry about the length so what we can do is I can just like how we remapped the numbers just like how we remapped the numbers we can remap 3d geometries so that the size of those three geometries remain the same whereas these numbers can be changed so I'll just come back here that is what remapping does and I mean I, I, I have to cover a lot of things today because this is like part four and you all are most welcome to try and test out you know go back to the first webinar and understand evaluate surface and some of these components in detail so I'll connect MD slider here okay this looks weird so let me just fix this okay so now you can see that this evaluate surface made a center point on each of these panels can you guys see that it has made a center point on each of these panels right it made a center point on each of these panels all right let's move forward so what I want to do today is instead of making an attract one single attractor point I want to make a curve let me make a curve around this and I want the point to travel on this curve so I can you know probably let me change this on the Y scale as well sorry Z scale So I'm just moving this point, all these points, so that this particular curve, you know, is floating or, you know, revolving around the entire tower. And there are processes to automate this, but I don't want to get into that much of complexity today because I know most of you are beginners here. And these concepts are very cool. I mean, if you just try to get the concept behind it, you can you know um, use it at so many different places so this is a curve that I've just made that is you know revolved around the entire uh, tower okay so what I can do here is let me okay let me just move this one a bit as well all right okay I want to make a curve on this uh, I want to make a point on this curve and I want the point to travel on this curve so what I can do is there is a command called curve I can right click on it set one curve and I can bring this curve inside grasshopper you can see that this curve has been bought inside grasshopper and then there is a command called point on curve if I connect this here you can see let me make it a bit more obvious by making a sphere around it so I'll just type in sphere let's increase the size of the sphere let me give it a radius of 20 okay so you can see that there is a point on the curve right now and if I change this this particular slider on point on curve that particular point travels on the entire curve right this particular point travels on the entire curve okay all right
so we have gotten a point attractor i want to make this sphere as my point attractor so wherever this sphere is all the windows near that particular sphere should be very small in size and all the windows that are far away from this particular point or sphere should be larger in size so what i can do is i can calculate the distance between the center points of each of these panels and the center point and the and this particular point here do you get it so far everyone i see that uh, some of you are dropping off it i mean it it can be a tricky concept to grasp at first but if you get it i am um, you can apply it at so many different places and this is just one small example of it here so there is a command called closest point closest point okay Sp typo closest point so what it does is it takes a lot of points inside it and it takes some uh, it takes a cloud point and it calculates the dis okay this one it calculates the distance between all the points you can see if i check the distance here it says 763 765 767 and if i actually move this the location of the sphere here all these distances automatically update right all the distances automatically update are you guys following along the, just the concept bit so when the when the when the sphere is here it is closest to these top uh, quads so the, they will be smaller in size and the quads at the bottom would be the maximum in size and as i change this everything should automatically update that is what i'm trying to do here that is what i'm trying to accomplish here all right so this is the closest point command now again this closest point command is covered in detail in the previous one i've been saying that quite a lot now i should probably type a note here okay all right so what i can do now is i want to scale these quads that are here based on the distance of this attractor point but the, so i will just type in scale and question is what do i want to scale where 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 are the quads i want to scale these quads right i want to scale these quads so what i what i can do is i will just type a relay again this relay is just for me to sort the script to make it look a bit more organized i want to uh, i want to scale these quads so i'll connect this in center forget about the output that is being shown in the in the preview what should be the center points the points that are coming out of evaluate surface it is giving me the position of all the center points so i'll just connect this point in center here and you can see everything is getting scaled by one single number let me hide this let me go ahead and hide this and let's also hide this and let's give it a custom preview color swatch so i'm just making the sphere look yellow in so that it pops out when we are looking at it okay yeah so now you can see that every all the quads have been scaled by one single factor because i did not define any number and if i define one single number let's say 0.5 so everything would be scaled by that number only you can see that everything is being controlled by one single number but i want to control the scaling using the number using these distances i want to control the factor using these distances but right now these distances are very huge 1107 1114 right these are very huge so i can change that at the concept that we have learnt of remap numbers i can apply the same concept here i can type in remap numbers again i can give it these distances and in let me just delete this and i'll give construct domain in target here so we have something really interesting for you to in the end of the, at the end of the session so make sure you stick till then 
those of you who are joining us just now drop in your names and email ids in the chat box so that we can share some of the resources with you and there is a link to join the whatsapp group as well pinned in the chat box you can use that to connect with us and you know where we can communicate with you about all the resources and some updates and everything okay so technically i am scaling so this domain should be between 0 and 1 and obviously i won't do 0 0.1 because that would make the window very small so i'll do something like 0 0.3 and let's do something like 0 0.85 and let's give this in domain start and domain end and in source i'll just again use bounds to get the minimum and maximum of this distance here and have a look here these were the original distances these are the original distances those of you who have a problem with graft it's, it's all right it's a tricky concept we'll be using graft again and i'll explain graft in detail to once again towards the end so don't worry okay these are the mapped values i'll connect these mapped here now you can see the proportion between the numbers are same but the distances have been scaled from 1107 to 0 0.8 triple one four to zero point eight four four so the proportion is similar but the number has changed between zero point three to zero point eight five okay all right i'll just delete these panels and i'll connect these mad values in factor here and look at what happens can you guys see that everything that is closer all the chords that are closer to this particular sphere up on top have been scaled a lot or or you know have uh, their sizes have shrunk down and the ones that are at the bottom they are large and look at what happens when i change the location of this sphere can you guys see that all the quads are getting updated as i'm moving this particular uh, ball up and down so this is an attractor point defined right now how many of you get what an attractor point is now type yes if you if you understood what an attractor point is so there is some latency okay understood great come on stay active in the chat box everyone i want to see some yeses before i move forward okay okay great so you can see that i'm controlling how big or how small these openings are through this attractor point all right now now let's take this complexity up uh, one step further okay let's let's change the complexity one step further Yes, got the concept, but little hard to grasp the workflow. It's all right, Karan. It is difficult to understand these concepts at first, but once you rewatch it, if you if you get the concept right, you'll always get the tool automatically with a little bit of experimentation and trial and error. You'll get the tool right. Try to get the concept behind it. That is the most crucial thing. Okay, let's come back now once i have scaled this what i want to do is let's say okay let me get a grab a couple of papers and stuff all right and let me change the scaling of my camera everyone have a look at my camera here so so far what we have done is we divided the uh, tower first of all we made the tower then we divided the tower into smaller quads so let's say this is one single quad okay then we scaled it so let's say this is the scaled quad this white paper here is the scaled quad now what i want to do is i want to move this scaled quad a bit far away from this original quad i want to move this scaled quad a bit far away from the scaled quad and then i want to make a surface between this original quad and this scaled quad do you get it original quad we scaled it like this now we are going to move it further 
far away from the original surface and then we'll make a surface between this one and this one so it should look something like let me reduce the size so it will look something like this so this is the original quad let's say this is the scaled quad and if I move it away if I move it away in this direction so it is sitting somewhere here then I want to make a surface between this moved quad and this original quad so it would look like a frustum okay it would look like a frustum do all of you get it what what we want to do here okay all right so let's try to move so when I have to move something I'll just type in move and as soon as I type move as soon as I type move there is a command called move there already so it is asking us for geometry that you have to move so we have to move the scaled quads and the, then it is asking us for motion motion is basically it is asking us in what direction do you want to move something and by how many units do you want to move something when I ask you that hey take this pen and move it so I'll, I'll also have to tell you how far away do you have to move it and which direction do you have to move it you can move it up and down forward and backward right so you have to tell that to the motion as well all right so since this geometry is 3d in nature that means if I move all of them in one single direction they will start intersecting with each other if I move them all of them in the Z direction they will start intersecting with each other that means if this is my surface let me once more for the last time probably show you the so if this is the uh, quad if I have to move it I need to move it in the normal direction right normal direction is 90 degree so if this surface is like this if it is sitting like this normal direction would be this if this surface is like standing upright normal would be this and so on and so forth right so I want to move it in the normal direction do you get, guys get what what normal direction is are you getting what normal direction is great so if you can see here when we evaluated the surface there was an output called normal there was an output called normal this is giving us normal direction of each of the facade each of the quad okay so let's let's move the quads in the normal direction so there is a command called amplitude so amplitude is used to take in a vector vector is basically direction so normal is a vector data normal is a direction data right it's a vector so I gave it this and then in amplitude I will tell it how far do you have to move it if I type in let's say 50 so it will move all the quads in by 50 units in the normal direction so I can connect this vector in motion and I'll connect this scale geometry in the move geometry okay let me hide everything and show you what the error is right now so this is this was our original quad and as you can see when, once I moved it everything go, got moved but it got moved inside because the uh, because that normal direction is towards the inside of the surface we can very easily fix that I can just type in reverse so that I can reverse the direction so I can connect this vector, vector or amplitude vector in reverse and I can connect it here and as soon as I do that can you guys see that all the quads have been moved in the normal direction by 50 units right and I can control how far or how close how close or how far they are by moving this slider yes everything clear so far all right now let's do fun so why move everything by 30 units 
when we can use this attractor point this attractor point here to control how everything is getting moved so how about everything that is closer to this particular sphere here gets moved less and everything that is far away gets moved more just like how we did with scaling just like how we did with scaling right so instead of 30 instead of giving it one single number of 30 what i can do here is let me keep sorting the script yeah what i can do here is i can use the same distances that are coming out of closest point and instead of remapping them between 0 0.3 and 0 0.85 i can remap them i can remap them construct domain let's say between 10 to 30 let's see how that looks instead of moving everything by one single unit i want this attractor point here to control how far everything is getting moved so everything that is close the closest quad will get moved by 10 units the farthest crowd will get moved by 30 units all right i'll connect this distance and value here and i can use the same bounds or i can again you know double click and type in bounds and give it this distance here and connect it here and don't worry when i'll share the script with you everything will be very neatly sorted so that you do not get confused with all these wires just try to grab the concept for now and if i connect this mad value in amplitude mad value in amplitude look what happens so can you guys see that this is very close to the initial surface and as i come down the quads are very far away or let me make it a bit more obvious by increasing this yes can you see that and if i move the position of this curve if of this attractor point the scaling is getting adjusted at the same time the quads are also moving in response to the attractor point pretty cool right okay if i highlight this have a look what happens here you can pretty much see that everything is getting moved and the best part is the best part is you can always come back and change the shape of your tower and everything would get automatically updated you could even change the rotation you could simplify it further make it a bit more elegant or make it very organic and everything will automatically update you do not have to worry about it ever again and just imagine if you have to do this manually in in some other modeling tool this would take you forever and if you have to change the design you have to do the entire thing all over again all over again so this saves a lot of time once you make a working script you can pretty much apply it to different buildings, different curves, I mean different scenarios. If you're not happy with the end result, you can always come back and tweak it again. Okay, so the final part is uh, to make a surface between this moved quad and this original quad so that we have some sort of frustums. Okay, let's try to do that. So where are the original quads? These are the original quads, right? In from the ISO trim that I have kind of made a relay of yes I'll again make a relay okay probably not okay I'll make one relay here relay is just like uh, extension wire so what do you do if the switchboard is very far away from your bed you br uh, you purchase an extension you connect it and you place the uh, extension board right next to your bed so does it change the electricity that is coming in no it just gives it just 
makes everything a bit more convenient for you. So similarly, consider relays the same. Okay. So these are moved quads. These are origin original quads. And if we check the data structure, it is very essential to keep on checking data structure. So right now, you can see that this data is pretty much grafted, but everything is again sitting in one single branch. To fix this, I'll, 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 there is something called graph tree. Again, I'll just do a graph tree. And if I graph this and then check the data structure, you can see that every surface has its own different branch, has its separate branch, right? Every surface has its separate branch. Similarly, I'll do the same thing with this one as well. And this will have its own separate branch. And now I can just loft them together. I'll just loft them together. Loft is a computation, uh, slightly computationally heavy command. So you can see that I made a surface. This entire thing now has frustums all over it. And I can control how far they are getting extruded if I reduce this 76 to maybe uh, 45 you can see that this this came closer or I can you know um, exaggerate it by doing something like 95 as well or I can also select this entire thing and probably scale it up I'll just increase the floor to floor height here Okay. All right. Now let's do something. Let's let's try to visualize it properly. So I'll come back to Rhino. Um, I'll go to materials tab here. If you do not see materials, you can click this uh, gear icon and turn on materials. I'll come to materials. I'll click on this plus icon and let's do plaster. You can change the color. So I'll change the color to grayish, grayish. Yeah. Okay, and then I'll again make a plastic sort of material for these windows. You can make a glass material, but for the sake of this example, I'm just doing a plastic material because it the, obviously there is nothing on the floor plate. So if we plot pl glass material, it would become see-through and uh, the output would just look weird, a bit weird. Okay, something like this. I'll bring grasshopper back again. What I want to do is I want to apply the plaster materials to this this curve, this lofted surfaces, the green surfaces here. So there is a command called custom preview. And this is nothing. This is not this is this won't bring any change in the geometry. This would apply a material. So if I give it this loft and if I right click on material, I can go to set one material and I'll choose plaster here. So it has applied this plaster material. And for this one here, for the windows, I'll again do custom preview. OK, now this one, I'll just make, I'll just probably copy this, connect it here. And for this, I'll right click and choose plastic. OK, now you can see that your tower, that your tower is kind of responding to the attractor point. So if I move this attractor point, obviously this will be computationally heavy because it is making a lot of surfaces. It, it is doing a lot of calculations. But you can see that as I'm moving the attractor point, everything is updating, right? scaling and movement and lofting. Everything is getting updated. And let me quickly go ahead and try a different curve altogether. So instead of having rectangle as the curve, I'll probably make and imagine making this. Imagine making something like this on some different tool. I'm sure that would take forever. And if there is a change, if you want to do some change, that is near to impossible. OK, I'll just disable the snap. And let's make a Uh, graph tree is there. You just have to type graph. It is not possible. Graph is a native component of Grasshopper.
okay let me turn this on and yeah so this is a curve that i have made right now let's try to use this curve as our base curve okay and let me change the z value here let me bring it down yeah okay so if i right click on this initial curve and do set one curve and select this curve here you can see that everything got replicated there are a couple of errors that we need to fix obviously because you know um, rectangle has different properties and a curve has different properties one of them being this reverse so if i let's see if this fixes things okay it did not but kind of the geometry kind of looks pretty cool okay what i can do is i can probably increase these divisionings so i divided this in three parts how about if i divide it in 12 parts let's see how that looks yeah so you can pretty much see that the same algorithm the same uh, uh, geometry that we define has been replicated onto this curve so with parametric workflow it becomes a visual exercise for you to finalize a design based on the constraints that you set and this was more about animation and this was more about a tractor and you know fusing a tractor points with uh, parametric skyscraper tower so you can very I am sure now if I come back to the website can you guys automatically make sense of how this entire algorithm is working this particular animation how is it working how many can how many of you can at least conceptually make sense of how this animation is working type yes if you can um, break it down inside your head yes right okay great so i can go ahead and let me just bake this i can great so right now this entire thing is inside grasshopper so let if you want to bring it to rhino for example if you bring it to rhino you lose the editability so let me bring it to rhino just see how the rendered output looks so i'll just group it yes please and i'll bake this as well yes please okay and I'll hide everything here minimize it and let's move this and if I go to rendered you can see that this is how it looks and if I check ray traced that will hang the computer a bit but it will try to render it in real time So this is how our final geometry is looking. Pretty dope, right? So quickly you can create so uh, such complexity, and at the same time, the things that you make are rational. These are mathematical objects. These are not assumptions. These are not SketchUp geometries that uh, that do not make sense mathematically this is everything here has been defined mathematically and you have absolute control over each and every element of this entire script right that is the best part of parametric architecture so if you're not happy with the design you can always change it back yeah I do not like it I can come back here and let's try to change the shape here and okay so you can see how it works right all right so this this particular session 
uh, was about understanding how you can relate attractor points to uh, different type of geometries in nature. Uh, I mean, different type of uh, objects. It could be a parametric facade. It could be a skyscraper. It could be any other things. I will ask in next webinar. Can explain all this in proper drawing with floor plans and windows so that we. It is proper, clear in a live project, properly clear in a live project. I mean, the thing that you're asking, you know, it takes an, any designing firm to, once you design it here, if you want to take it to manufacturing or constructional level, there is a lot of things that go inside it. It's not that straightforward of a process. So yes, we will one day reach that level where in free webinars, we'll be discussing all those things, probably not in the next one, but in the near future, definitely. In the next webinar, we'll be doing something more interesting. Before all of you go off, uh, I would like to discuss an interesting opportunity here with all of you. It is something called computational form finding or parametrized. Those of you who are very interested in learning parametric architecture, learning how you can apply computational design, especially in India, uh, because we hear a lot of things like it's very costly, clients do not want it. That's that's complete bullshit. You hear that because most of the faculties that are out there in the colleges, it does not it is not in our educational curriculum, parametric architecture or computational design. It is not in our curriculum. If you talk about colleges like A London and, and IAC Barcelona, they start taking up these tools from the second year itself because they understand the importance of evolving architects with technology. So this parameterized uh, workshop is a five day workshop in which uh, we start off from the absolute rhino grasshopper basics. Each day is about seven hours uh, all on weekends wherein we explore data structure, grafting and all the things that you just were wondering about animations and everything would be covered in here. And with some advanced plugins like Kangaroo, Weaver Bird and Mesh Plus, Kangaroo is a physics plugin through which you can simulate forces on the geometries that you make. Okay, now, how did parametric architecture came into play? How many of you have heard of Antony Gaudi? I mean, that's not a right question to ask. I'm sure everyone must have heard of him. So what Antony Gaudi did is, and okay. Antony Gaudi string experiment and there is a typo again. All right. So Antony Gaudi is called like is is, is like the fa father of parametric architecture. What he did is he started evolving his designs by making models like these. So what he would do is he would take strings, he would tie weights onto them, and then um, suspend them. So what happens is if you take a rope, tie it, and you know probably suspend it with a load. It becomes something like this. If this automatically redistributes all this shape automatically redistributes all the load uniformly onto the entire surface. And if you just flip it, the compressive force becomes equal to the uh, uh, equals. Um, I mean, uh, this just the way how arches are self balanced and self optimized these shapes these walls become self optimized so this is how he started manually started experimenting designing things like these out of which buildings like these came into play so if i if i could find an example here somewhere okay not this one so this is a very interesting concept that he kind of developed uh, so many years ago and you can pretty much see the same sort of arch thing happening all over his structures. I'm not finding the right image here. So you can see how this for this this particular chain model has been photographed and then he would reverse this and then start making designs as you can see in this one. These are hanging chain models that he did. With us, he had a complexity that for him, it was a challenge for him to kind of uh, make these complex models, click them. And if he had to do any change, it was a lot of manual work. We can, with us, we have an advantage. We have computers. We can simulate all of this inside the computer. 
So that is what we do here in this workshop. And then there was Frey Auto. Let me let me walk you through the history of parametric architecture very briefly. So this was Gaudi. Then came Frey Auto. And he started off with so bubble. He was fascinated by his methodology of hanging chains. Instead of hanging chains, he started experimenting with soap bubbles. So he started developing things like these. And this is just a soap bubble in which a wire has been pushed. And I mean, you all must have played uh, with soap bubbles uh, when you were a child. It's just that he did it when he was old and he tried to generate some concepts out of it. So he made designs from this and his, his most of his work were uh, based on tensile structures. So have a look at this photo here. This is a soap bubble. Have a look at this photo. Then out of which he made a model that looked like this. This is a net model. And then out of this, he made something like let me see if I can find it. This is a model of that. This is a computer simulated model of the same. Let me show you. Let me see if I can find it right here quickly. Yeah. He made things like these. Now, if I come here and search for Beijing Airport by Zaha Hadid Architects, can you guys? relate this particular shape here or this particular geometry patrick by the way patrick schumacher and zaha hadid both of them are uh, i mean they have said this in multiple interviews that they were very highly inspired by findings of Frey auto so can you guys relate this particular shape here with the shape here that you see type yes if you can relate it right now Can you guys relate it? Yes. So the thing is, with all the years, methodology has changed from manual experimentation, so bubbles to computers and computation, from tensile fabric to concrete and space frame and different materials. But the narrative behind the architecture or the story behind is still intact. So if you want to do something new, if you want to bring a revolution, with your architectural design process, sometimes you have to take the learnings of some of the greatest architects out there and evolve those learnings according to you and make it your own. Do something new with that. That is how evolution happens. If someone said that, hey, uh, the car that we are driving in today I will not I want to design a uh, design a car, but I will not take the things that are already designed in the modern day car that we drive today, but rather I'll go back to the ancient times and I will start from there. Chances are 90% 99% of the designers won't be able to come up with a very good design that is even comparable to something that we have today. So you have to take a reference of the advancements that have happened in the field and then take you know um, evolve them further so this is what we also cover in this in this five day sort of thing and then it has a competition you I'm, I'm posting this link in the chat box you guys can check it out and on day one it's all about introduction to rhino grasshopper and you know this is a workshop where this is not a webinar this is a workshop where i'll introduce a concept i'll give you the time to uh do it on your screen if you come across doubts it's a limited seat program there are only 60 seats and you know it, it's our signature workshop so uh, each of you will be doing it on your screen simultaneously when you come across doubt you can share your screen you can unmute yourself you can turn on your videos talk to me and you know do things like that and then day one is all about uh, i mean we just did one attractor point here in this one we can do 100 attractor points diff and just not attractor points. We can do attractor curves as well. 
so that is what we do on day one lists and data management grafting baking flattening all that all of that stuff day two is where we develop parametric facades working with grids and skyscraper developments the things that we did today advanced concepts of that day three is where we start with meshes and Anthony Gaudi's methodologies where we develop things like these the ones that you see right here up in the banner and Day four is minimal surface development with Frey Autos and Zaha's evolution and there would be a competition that would be uh, uh, That would be introduced on day four and you all will get a week's time you will collaborate you'll work in group there would be group of fives uh, and the participation is global so you will be co collaborating with people from all across the globe which is like one of the biggest thing in architecture that till the time you're in college it's solo but once you walk out of college it's all about collaboration with MEP consult with consultants with contractors with fellow architects with designers with draftsmen. it's all about collaboration so you learn to collaborate Yes, you guys can start posting your questions. I'll just address all the questions right after this. Yeah, and I'll be taking this session. And these are some of the outputs that have been produced by some of the participants who are absolute beginner in the field. And let me go to this link here. Slash archive. Okay, so I'll also share this link with all of you in the chat box and this this basically holds some of the best work that the participants have produced and reminded that these were from first year, second year, some of them were professionals and they had as absolutely no idea of what parametric architecture is. These are some of the designs out of the competition entries. And I would encourage all of you to visit this archive page to get some inspiration out of it in your for your projects of how students are learning and evolving their design, you know, upping their design game. So I'll come back here and these are some of the testimonials. This is a virtual exhibition. So after the competition on the next Sunday, there's a virtual exhibition where you get to present your work, where you give a presentation. And if you win in the competition, there are some exciting prizes and registrations are currently live. And if you register before 25th of this month, uh, you can avail a heavy discount as well. So yeah, you guys can check it out at your on your at your pace. And now I will be doing some questions. So start posting some questions in the chat box right away. Um, I'm working on a dissertation topic blend of vernacular and parametric architecture and to study the, its influence on modern architecture in India. Are there any examples I can study India or abroad? So definitely you can check it out. Uh, one of the projects uh, yes, that Equim did with few, by fusing vernacular architecture of bamboo materials with parametric architecture. It's a project that we have done in here in Noida. So you can pr probably find it, it up on Instagram. Uh, so you can check that out. You can check out some of the projects in, in Bali and, and, and Vietnam. They have been doing some incredible work of fusing parametric architecture with vernacular. Look, vernacular, people get confused. People think that parametric architecture is all about uh, robotic manufacturing, uh, all about CNC cutting, laser cutting, and you know uh, 3D printing, which is very costly. No, that's, that's, that's myth. It's entirely up to you. Have a look at this bench here. I'll just search for studio. We had architect Amit Gupta from Studio Symposis in one of our previous uh, workshops of Parametrized as a guest speaker, Studio Symbiosis bench. Let me see if this gives me some output. Um, no, let me go to their website probably then. Meanwhile, we also kind of did uh, something called DAM, which was digital art movement that happened this month, where this was a two-day uh, initiative, wherein we did cover 
tools like Rhino, Maya, Blender, Grasshopper, and we had mentors from Zaha, senior architect from Zaha, Spain, and myself, and and you from UCL Bartlett, Lender professors, and you know architects from Zaha, from designers from Adidas, who talked about the use of computation design and and how this entire field is changing the way architects design and it's just a matter of time when when the ancient technologies be become obsolete it's just a matter of time so this one here so if i talk about this this one so he was very uh, kind on explaining do you know what what was the drawing that was that they gave this that they gave to the carpenter to fa fabricate this particular bench just one rectangle the drawing was the drawing looked something like this just one rectangle with few lines on it and they informed him that all the lines just measure this distance and just cut a you know uh, cut a slit on the wood and that is how this was fabricated so it is entirely up to the architect of how you want to take your learnings further and you know evolve it further so these are some of the sheets that are produced for the competition and obviously you get a project that is portfolio ready to showcase your capabilities and on in parametric architecture so now i'm working okay i did this question the cost i think the cost is covered great guys if you guys have any more questions feel free to ask them right away in the next two minutes in the chat box and then we can call it a day for today I hope you had a fun session. How, let me know in the chat box how the session went for you. Did you learn something new? Was it was it exciting? Did you find something useful here? And also, if you have not left your email IDs in the chat box, names and email IDs, do that so that we can share some resources. And do join the WhatsApp group to stay in touch. OK, I see that there are not many questions. So thanks a lot for joining in and I will see you in the next free webinar. Meanwhile, make sure that you check out uh, uh, Parametrized that is on equimdesigns.com and I would encourage all of you to share the things that you have learned today, develop something um, of your own from the webinar series that we are doing and share with us on Instagram. So. I'll just quickly, if you are not already following our channel, you can, you know, uh, quickly check it out. We do a lot of educational posts on how this uh, entire field is changing, how architecture takes benefit from different ideologies and methodologies. So this is something for you. And if you develop something of your own, make sure you ta share it up on Instagram and tag us at equim underscore edu. Thanks for joining and I will see you in the next one. Bye.